Hello everyone and welcome to our first, oh, hi everyone, welcome to our first virtual Behind the Hype uh, meetup. Some of you may have already come to a previous Behind the Hype, so I'll give a, or some of you may be new, so I'll give you a bit of background. Behind the Hype is, Behind the Hype is a series of meetups which we run typically uh, in person uh, across London, Paris, New York, and other locations where we try and tackle uh, overhyped topics in finance, technology, or fintech. Uh, and it tends to be a good place to come and learn something new, ask questions, meet people as well. So throughout the, the session, we've got some great speakers lined up. Uh, you can also ask any questions in the comment box um, and ask them as and when it pops into your head. We'll answer some of them as we go, so all the speakers can see the questions as they come in. Um, and equally, we'll leave some room at the end to to kind of tackle them questions and get a conversation going. So um, I realise I didn't, didn't introduce myself. My name's Ryan, and I work at Finastra. I'm going to now pass over to Shireen, who is an innovation director from Finastra, just to introduce our, our speakers. Thank you, Ryan. Hello, everyone. Um, so today we're really excited to have our to have our uh, first online meetup um, focusing on AI applications in fintech. We'll uh, hear first from uh, Don Lee and uh, Nan Sun, two brilliant data scientists from our innovation team. That take you through uh, an intro to um, the Finastra Innovation Lab, as well as uh, some of the projects they've been working on. Then we'll hear from uh, Gilles Moïse, who's um, the founder and CEO of uh, Recital, an amazing fintech focused on NLP applications in fintech. Um, so let's get started. Over to you, Don and Nan. Hello everyone. Uh, how's everyone's doing? Uh, we're Diane and uh, the data scientists from our Finestra Innovation Lab, and we're so excited to be here. And uh, so, uh, first of all, I didn't. I just gonna give you guys a brief introduction of myself. So I'm Nan, a data scientist at Finestra Innovation Lab. I joined Finestra since uh, last June, and I got my master's degree in information systems and operations management uh, from University of Florida. And I got my uh, bachelor's degree uh, back in China. And even though I was a business intelligence advisor uh, after I graduated from school, and I always wanted to be a data science, like be in the data science world, I really enjoyed uh, working here at Finestra and with a lot of like opportunities and projects and a great up, a great peoples and teammates that I can learn a lot from. Hey everyone, um, this is Don. I'm also a data scientist um, here at Finestra Innovation Lab. Um, I got my bachelor's degree in math and master's degree in statistics, both from um, Georgia Tech here in Atlanta. Um, so I joined Finestra back in November last year and um, being part of the innovation lab really gives me many opportunities to experiment with um, new technologies and um, some fun machine learning things, uh, which makes our work really exciting. Yeah, so, so here's the topics we're going to cover today uh, first. We're going to give you guys a quick introduction of who we are and what we do in Innovation Lab. And then we move on to uh, machine learning and then we'll give you guys a uh, over with the machine learning pipeline. And after that, she will give you guys a brief overview of some uh, applications we use in our lab projects. So uh, our Finestra Innovation Lab is based in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, we have a team of data scientists and software uh, engineers, you know, uh, whose main goal is to apply artificial intelligence and machine learning to all kind of like uh, finan fin financial domains. And we seek to uh, build in, in, uh, in 
and we we seek to build like in <laughs> like innovation uh, solutions and take our uh, research to like products. So uh, we talk a lot like about machine learning and artificial intelligence a lot. So uh, the question might pop up into your mind, like what exactly is machine learning? And Andrew, a prominent uh, machine learning figure, uh, defines machine learning as a science of getting computers to act without being explicitly programmed. This may sound a little strange, but we will dive into machine learning as we go through the presentation. So we have heard like artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, like almost every day. So what's the relationship among these three things? To some of us, it might be new. Like AI artificial intelligence has been around since like 1950s. Artificial intelligence is a very broad and general field of computer science, uh, which is a uh, concern with uh, concern like get, getting a computer to think like a human. And they focus on building the algorithms, processing uh, information, making two decisions. And uh, machine learning came around like 1980s, uh, which is a subfield of artificial intelligence. It focused on training a program, uh, specifically teach the machine how to make a decision. And deep learning is uh, newer, which is a subfield of uh, machine learning, which came around like 2010. Mm. We, we use a deep learning uh, is like how we can automatically like extract the information for future prediction or make a decision. So from this chart, we can see there are three types of machine learning pro problems, uh, supervised learning, unsupervised learning and reinforcement learning. As we go through the presentation, we will uh, be learning like this type of learning uh, machine learnings and problems that we can solve. So supervised learning. Supervised learning is a most common uh, sub-branch of machine learning today. And so supervised machine learning algorithms are designated to like to learn by examples. The name supervised originates from the idea that training this type of algorithm is like in having a teacher sup supervise the whole process. So uh, supervised learning's data has labels, uh, which is a specific target we are wishing to learn or predict. Uh, supervised learning uh, can be split into uh, two subcategories, regression and classification. Uh, regression is a predictive statistical process uh, where the model attempts to find the uh, important relationship uh, between the dependent and independent variables. Uh, the goal of a regression algorithm is to predict the continuous number, such as like sales, income, and test score. Uh, for example, like we see here, the picture showing like if I am a weather reporter, uh, I'm gonna predict like what's the weather, uh, what's the temperature going to be tomorrow? Is that gonna be 84 or it's gonna be 76? So that's a like a specific number we're gonna uh, predict. And for classification algorithm, uh, it's like we'll be given like data points with assigned uh, uh, categories. So like uh, the job of a classification algorithm is to take an input value and assign to a class or category. For example, I'm still a weather reporter and I'm gonna predict like, is it weather gonna be cold or hot tomorrow? So, so like in our life, uh, we have these two use cases which apply in, in, re in regression and, uh, and classification. So we have a model which use all kinds of like payment information to predict the volume of the transaction, uh, which is a regression problem. And the other one is we use household financial activities information, like to have a prediction on whether the household will leave this financial institution or not, which is a, a classification problem. And so unlike the supervised learning, uh, supervised learning is a sub, uh, like a set of uh, statistical tools for scenario in which there's only like features and no targets. So uh, we cannot make predictions since there are no associate response uh, to each observation. 
Instead, uh, we are interested uh, in finding the hidden structure uh, within the data. And today we'll be focused like two problems with unsupervised uh, learning, clustering and dimensionality reduction. Uh, clustering uh, refers to a broad set of techniques uh, for finding subgroups or clusters in a data site. Uh, this helps us uh, partition observations into distinct groups so that each group contains observations that are similar to each other. For example, in this chart, uh, we have tons of food here and cl a clustering model group them into pizzas and tacos, no matter what color or topping on the pizza or taco. In our life, we use this clustering model like to group a household in retail banks into segmentations and we believe like within each group, this household have uh, similar financial activities or other similarities. And uh, for dimensionality reduction is where we try and to reduce the dimensionality of the data. For example, we have a data with like 50 columns that, but that is too much for us to build a certain model. So we want to represent it within, with like 10 columns. One of the use cases in our lab uh, projects is like when we're trying to build a loan approval prediction model for mortgage bar, and we have too much information in the data. We use this uh, dimensionality reduction method represent all the columns or information into fewer columns. And then, and then so here's a demo of our, uh, our uh, lab projects, which is called Fusion Analytic International. Uh, in our lab, we use like couple machine learning uh, use cases and apply to this uh, dashboard. Welcome, Welcome to the to Fusion, Fusion Analytics, Analytics International, International dashboard. dashboard. This, this dashboard, dashboard is powered, is powered by, machine by machine learning and is geared to help institutions understand their past, present, and forecasted transaction, transaction trends, trends, as well as, well as plan, plan for the future, future to retain and grow their customer base. Let's, Let's jump, jump right in. in. At the, At the top, top, we have, we have some, some key performance, performance indicators, indicators, the total, total and average, average transaction, transaction amounts, amounts, and the total, and the total number, number of customers, customers and accounts. The heat, the heat map, map on the right shows us that most of the customers are located in Bangladesh. This, this information gives us a good idea about our current customers, customers. but let's, well, let's drill, drill into the transactions. transactions. Looking, Looking at, the at the trend of the transaction amount and transaction count, count we, see we see a spike in activity, activity, but the future prediction is trending downward. This is not a good sign for the institution and is a, is a bit unusual, unusual considering the increase in the number of customers, customers in June. June. Below, Below we can see how the machine learning, learning algorithms have clustered the customers based on various features. features. By, clicking By clicking on one of the clusters, clusters you can filter, filter the, the other, other visuals to learn more about those customers. customers. To, the to the right, we can see a forecast for all of the high-risk customers. customers. And this, and this forecast, forecast tells us that the number of high-risk high customers, customers should decrease by December. Below, Below we can see each individual's churn forecast for the next one, Three, three and, six and six months. months. The tree map below, below that shows us which features, features the machine learning model, model found to be the most important for predicting churn. churn. But to, to understand, understand the important, important features for a specific customer, we can, we go, can go down, down to the churn, churn explanation, explanation section. section. Each, Each of these graphs, graphs represents, represents one feature, feature. And, the and the first bar represents the average value, value for all of the customers who are not at risk of churn. This gives, this gives insight, insight into, into each customer's, customer's individual, individual risk, risk and can, can help decide on a course of action, action for increasing, increasing retention. retention. For example, for example by, by clicking on a high-risk high customer, customer, we see a few things. Low transaction amounts and volume, and it has been nearly six months since their last transaction. It's clear that this customer is not active with their current products, so to decrease their churn risk, we should recommend a product. This is an enterprise customer, so we can move down the page to the product recommendation section and choose a new enterprise product to offer them. The bottom two charts show the products with the highest transaction amounts and volumes, but since we've selected a customer above, we can see the products that they use. In summary, this dashboard helps banks understand their customer base and transaction activity. Machine learning is used in a few key areas. Transaction forecasting to see predictions for amounts and volumes, clustering to group the customers and understand their behaviors, churn to identify groups and individuals at high risk of leaving the institution, and product recommendation to offer the best products for increasing retention. This dashboard is designed to allow the financial institution to uncover trends in their past and present activities, as well as speak into the future to find the proper course of action.
Um, yeah, so now that um, everyone has some understanding of uh, where machine learning is and the type of machine learning problems we can solve, let's get into the actual machine learning pipeline and some basic machine learning principles. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, a machine learning pipeline enables us to automate machine learning workflows. Um, it gives us control over the whole implementation and also some flexibility to make improvements on any step um, without changing the rest of the system. So on the screen, you can see the diagram, which is a, a general machine learning pipeline. Um, we start our process at data ingestion. Um, so the data source could either be a database or a site of files, such as um, CSV or JSON files. And then after we retrieve the data, um, we go into the next step, which consists of pre-processing, um, feature extraction, and feature selection. So raw data is almost always dirty. Um, and then at pre-processing, we can clean the data, um, handle all the different data types and missing values. Um, and then at feature extraction, we generate features, um, which are just descriptive characteristics around the data. Um, we do that by reformatting, combining, and um, transforming all the data so that it's uh, suitable for the machine learning algorithm we're going to use later on. Um, and then at feature selection, we pick um, the most useful features for the model. Um, we do that by removing all the redundant or irrelevant features. So after the features are ready, um, we split the data into test data set and um, training data sets. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we train our model based on the training data and um, test our model on the testing data set across, um, against a, a set of uh, performance metrics. And then uh, we can tune the model by changing its parameters and um, evaluate the corresponding performance metrics. Um, the, so the model tuning um, uh, the model training, testing, and tuning portions are an iterative cycle. So we repeat this process until um, we get the desired performance. Um, and then we can deploy the model and monitor it. Okay. So there are many um, uh, lines of businesses and um, use cases. Um, in the financial domain that can benefit from uh, leveraging AI. And here we're gonna, we're gonna um, showcase some of them um, at Finestra. Yeah, so um, today we see a lot of examples where um, AI is used in finance. Um, here are just some examples. So in lending and loan management, uh, machine learning algorithms are used to compute and determine um, the credit worthiness of a borrower before approving them for a loan. Um, so this can streamline the lending process and improve experience for both the borrowers and um, a loan officer. So in risk management, uh, machine learning can help to explore, um, evaluate, and possibly eliminate risk, um, including market risk and operational risk and some other type of risks. Um, and then next in, in fraud detection, as we know, there are like a large amount of transactions occurring every single day um, at the banks. And it's, it's quite impossible for humans to look through every single one of them and um, decide which is fraudulent or not. So uh, machine learning can help automate these tasks and make the process more efficient and also more accurate. Um, so uh, yeah, some other examples also include, you know, payment processing, um, and on a writing credit score. Um, but there are a lot more other um, use cases in, in finance as well. So um, next, we're going to show some projects we have done at um, Finestra. So um, at the Innovation Lab, we focus on real-time analytics, optimization, and actionable insights. Um, here are some of the crew projects we have worked on. Um, with the, the mortgage bot L insight on the, on the first row, um, the second one, uh, we use lending data to predict if the loan will be approved or not before the, the loan officer uh, processes the loan. 
which helps to uh, automate the loan approving process and you know save the bank uh, a lot of time. Um, and then in, in retail international, uh, we're building financial product recommendation for customers. And then in TCM, um, we have used neural networks in detecting trade anomalies. So at our innovation lab, as you can see, uh, we have built all types of models across many lines of businesses, um, all leveraging machine learning. So that's all for our presentation. Hopefully um, this is useful for you guys and please uh, feel free to reach out to any of us if you have questions. Thanks a lot, John and Anne. Let's continue now with uh, Gilles on uh, Resigil and how uh, you're using AI and machine learning. Okay, great. Um, hi, everyone. So I'm just going to share my screen. There you are. Okay, right. Okay. Um, so, uh, hi, everyone. I'm um, Gilles, the CEO and co founder of Recital. Um, so Recital uh, is a startup um, located in Paris uh, that we founded in 2017. Uh, we are now uh, 30 people. Uh, we just completed our Series A uh, a few months ago, uh, and we are an AI uh, software editor um, uh, dedicated to natural language processing. And actually, NLP in French is TAL, hence the name Recital. Um, so actually, we are focusing on text and uh, unstructured data because this is actually the largest amount of data in enterprise. Um, and the thing is that uh, very recently, uh, there have been great improvements uh, on um, there have been great sorry, improvements um, in natural language processing. Uh, and as uh, we have just been presented, thanks to deep learning. Um, so the goal of Recital is to allow the companies uh, using really the latest research in deep learning. Um, actually, um, among the 30 people uh, of, uh, in the company, six of us have PhDs in computer science in um, NLP more specifically, and we're working with uh, Stuart Russell, um, who is uh, AI professor at uh, UC Berkeley, and uh, with Antoine Bord, who is the head of research at uh, Facebook in Europe. Uh, so this way, we make sure that our customer benefits from the, the latest research. Um, I also invite you to come on our website so recital.ai uh, and uh, you will see the, the research papers we have. Um, and the second thing is that um, uh, actually we all know that we spend um, a lot of time uh, finding information. So um, apparently it's um, one full week per year per employee uh, spent on that. So we developed a product which is called Genius. And why is it called Genius? Because you can show him tons of documents and then you can ask him a question and he's going to find the answer within the documents. Um, so uh, and as opposed to a traditional search engine, it is not based on keywords, but it is based on uh, neural representations of the language. Uh, and the second thing is that uh, it can also split your documents into smaller parts so that what it returns is not a list of documents, but directly the answer within your document. So you don't have you know, to uh, find the specific string within the document once you have uh, the list of documents as in a traditional search engine. Um, so this is a snapshot. I'm going to do a demo of the soft right after. 
Um, so this is basically the snapshot. So here uh, you you have uh, the um, the question uh, within the search bar, uh, and then down you have the name of the document and highlighted in yellow the answer you're looking for so you directly have the answer a bit like um, the snippets that you have in google but the main difference is that everything can be deployed on your premises so you don't have to open your documents you can keep them private um so uh, actually there are obviously many interests in this kind of solution the first one obviously is uh, the, the the time saving uh, but the second one is also uh, related to operational risk because we know that when an employee when a collaborator cannot find an answer then he's going to try to answer uh, either uh, by trying to remember the, the good answer for instance for, for a customer or by asking his neighbor but maybe his neighbor doesn't have the right answer so here you allow your employees accessing the right data directly so you mitigate your operational risk you also allow your employees to focus on value-added task which is uh, better for them as well um, you allow knowledge to be shared throughout the company and then obviously we can connect uh, uh, our genius solution with your content management system already implemented okay so uh, now let's see um, a demo of of, uh, of the software so here sorry for that slide but here is the um, list of documents we've uploaded on genius so as you can see so all those documents obviously are public um, as you can see, some of them comes from the Fed, some of them from the um, JP Morgan publication, and some others from Goldman Sachs. Here, we, we put those uh, 36 documents only for the purpose of uh, demo, but obviously we can handle a much larger data set. We are currently uh, live in a large French bank um, where we have... Um, I think 50,000 documents uh, and 13,000 users. So the genius. So here is the very classical login screen. So there we are. OK. So when you log in, this is what you have so as you can see we have here 180 in documents because we have other numbers, but we're not going to uh, play with them um, and so here you can ask your questions you can also uh, add what we call those kind of binary filters so if you want to um, specify either some specific documents specific types of documents uh, number of pages if you have validity dates you can you can add them here you can also add some uh, specific keywords saying that okay just search in the documents containing those keywords and so on so here for instance you can ask um a question so i don't, don't remember yeah yeah i think it's this one yeah so here for instance we're going to run the demo and that set so then obviously you can import your hierarchies and stuff and um, also allow some part of the hierarchy to be uh, used by different groups or different users so here for instance you can ask a question about um, s p 500 and you ask uh, what is uh, s p 500 market cap distribution okay and then as you can see so you have the name of the document which is written which is a pdf with 20 pages and it gives you that distribution so the good thing here is that you don't have to you know click on a link and then search with a document 
uh, whether you have the right answer or not. You have it straight away. And when you click on that paragraph, then uh, you, you, you open the document at the right page, uh, which is also useful, you know. So that's, yeah, there you are. Um, so as I just said before, we're using not only keyword-based representation for the language, but also neural representation of the language. So it allows us to be robust to uh, different ways of asking the same questions. For instance, here, if you ask S&P 500 market cap, then you have the same answer. And this is um, one of the main advantage of the product, because if you have 10 ways of asking the same question and finding the same answer, then you spend 10 tests in such information. And this really is something very, very important for this kind of solution. Then you can ask, you know, different question. Yeah, the, the, the important thing with the with the other example is that you can ask either questions or keyword-based queries, and it, it is able to understand both. So, for instance, you can ask what is the strategy uh, to mitigate currency shocks. So here you have obviously different strategies which are presented, like this one. So this, this is important because you know many times you can have um, uh, different answers to the same question. So here, for instance, you have an answer um, automatically found from uh, that document. Uh, and actually, when you open it, uh, you see that yeah, strategic and corporate finance roadmap. Significant currency shocks impact most aspects of corporate finance. And so here they give you several approaches and approaches to mitigate that currency shock. Yeah, just to make it clear, obviously um, those questions, I mean, are not um, hard coded in a, in a, this is really like a search engine. Uh, this is not like a chatbot, you know, <clears throat> usually in a chatbot, you have to specify a list of questions and answers. And when he, he cannot find the, the, um, the right answers, he says, OK, sorry, I don't know. Here you, you written something based on the document. You can also, you know, whether um, in order to to explain uh, the engine, whether he was right or wrong, you can have that sum up or sum down. And then uh, Genius is going to retrain himself in order to uh, to enhance the scores. Uh, you can ask different kind of questions, like how to protect yourself, uh, like against yes, yeah, so against FX variations. Yeah, and here again, it says okay. You can do that product to say, but um, uh, adjust in pricing. Um, so yeah, that this is for for the um, for the genius demo. Uh, don't hesitate, obviously, to uh, either to interrupt or you know just to to ask if you have any questions. I'm looking at the at the comments, and so, no, that's that's fine for the moment. But then, obviously, don't hesitate. Um, so this is genius. The good thing is that uh, you can actually uh, go into your uh, document uh, part and then, you know, add or remove documents. So all those documents are public, obviously. Uh, and then once you have added all your documents, you just have to say index and then uh, all your documents are taken into account. So. Um, if actually you're interested in our solution, uh, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me. Uh, so I think you've got my email uh, in the chat or, uh, or otherwise in the recital.ai uh, website, you can find a contact form um, because uh, we can obviously open an access so that you put your documents, you index, and you can start playing with it. 
Okay, so this is genius, let's say, in the in the search use case. But what is very interesting also with that kind of technology is that since you don't um, return um, a whole document, but a small paragraph within the document, then you can perform information extraction. And actually, that's what we did on the LIBOR use case. So um, as, you, as you certainly know, the LIBOR was the index used in, uh, for corporate loans, and it has been used in uh, hundreds uh, of thousands of contracts. Uh, the thing is that the, the LIBOR won't be legal uh, starting from uh, January 1st, 2021, so starting from next year. And so um, big companies, uh, big, big banks, sorry, have to review all these kind of contracts in order to, uh, uh, to rewrite and to renegotiate them. Sometimes alternate clauses are defined, sometimes not, you know, alternate benchmarks. So, you know, they have to um, automatically analyze that. And so what we did is that uh, we used our genius search engine to automatically ask questions over each contract and extract the relevant clause so that the legal people can very quickly uh, choose and say, okay, uh, is it the is it the is that contract okay for that uh, for the removal of the labor or do I have to change something and so on? So here, uh, the <coughs> the examples I'm going to show um, come from the Edgar database, which is actually a database of public contracts. So here you have a list of those twenty public contracts. We run the engine. Uh, and it lasted, uh, it lasts, sorry, uh, 11 minutes. Uh, and for each contract, the top three paragraphs that, according to Genius, actually describe the LIBOR clause um, are returned. And so this is an example. So first contract, we asked uh, some question, like what is the interest rate? What is the base rate? So, you know, we try different way of asking the same question and then we return the best um, paragraphs and we did same that we did the same thing for the alternative rate so same thing we ask different questions and then it automatically repeats asking these questions over each contract so that in only two pages we have like 300 pages contracts uh, like summarized in a way uh, so this is the this is the return. So, so so you know it generates a report allowing you to see for each of your contracts which one uh, have has uh, the correct or not or incorrect LIBOR definitions. Same thing for this one. Here, what is the interest rates? And automatically it highlights you know that LIBOR daily. And here, what is the alternate rate? And here it defines the alternate rate. Yeah, same thing here. Okay, so um, thank you much. Uh, obviously, don't hesitate to uh, well ask me your questions. And uh, here are our uh, contacts. So same thing, don't hesitate to get in touch with us if you have any question or if you want to test the, the software. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, for your presentations. Um, we're now going to go over to Q&A. So just to give every, everyone who's watching a chance, uh, post your questions in the comments section and we'll get to them. Uh, to kick off, um, Giles, carrying on with you, what's the, just out of interest, like how did you come about the solution? You know, was this an issue that you were facing uh, and that's why you thought actually this is a, a business potential 
uh, business idea. Um, what's a bit more of that background to how this all came about? Yeah, well, actually, um, so I've got I've got a, a computer science um, um, a training, and then I worked in in consulting companies, um, so Capgemini and Ernst and Young, and then I I passed a PhD in um, artificial intelligence, and more specifically in natural language processing, and um, well, actually, after my PhD, I I noticed that. Uh, the solutions that were uh, available on the market um, really did not um, use the latest development of AI. And so um, we thought with my co-founder that, that really we should um, uh, make that uh, available for everyone. And uh, so we quite naturally went to uh, banks and insurance um, because actually they are uh, the, the the business uh, which handled the, the let's say the, the biggest amount of of documents, uh, you know, with contracts, uh, many different contracts, um, you know, retail banking, uh, CIB, uh, all the different branch of 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 the banks, and uh, same thing for for the insurance companies, uh, and so that that's what we did. And uh, during these three first years, we were self funded. We were profitable from day one. Uh, because we thought that uh, being profitable is uh, certainly the best way of making sure that your product uh, interests people since you can sell it. Um, and then so we, we just closed our Series A at the beginning of the year um, so as to, to grow bigger. And just a, a follow-up question. You mentioned about how NLP, natural language processing, has improved. And you mentioned around deep learning. What have been the, like, what's enabled that improvement? Has something happened in the market? Has there been, you know, open source tool that you've used? Like, what's caused that improvement? Yeah, actually, what really improved um, uh, NLP, thanks to deep learning, is what we call uh, self-supervised learning. Um, the thing is that, um, as it was um, very well explained uh, before, uh, uh, deep learning really um, uh, became famous from 2010, but with images. Um, and with text, we didn't really have the right approach, you know, to end, to understand textual data. And from 2017, we started uh, using self-supervision. So self-supervision is actually a way of allowing the machine to learn um, by itself uh, thanks to the huge amount of text which is available on the web. And so how does it work? So, so there is a famous model which has been released uh, by Google uh, in 2018, which is called BERT. And uh, to train that model, what you do is that you take the whole Wikipedia in 104 languages and you split the whole Wikipedia into separate paragraphs. And then you show a paragraph to your neural network, you just hide like three words within the paragraph and you ask the model to predict them and then you go to the next paragraph and when you do that over the whole wikipedia in 104 languages at the end the neural network to the model has learned that uh, for instance car and vehicle are synonyms that car coach and voiture so across languages mean the same thing and also that a word, depending on its context, will have different meaning. And the great thing about that is it is totally unsupervised. So you just have, you know, to let your algorithm run, uh, ingest tons of data, and then at the end, it can, uh, uh, it, it, it allows you this kind of very powerful representation of the language. And that's really what, on, on that kind of bricks that we, we built our solution. Cool, thank you. Uh, Dawn and Nan, there's financial services is massive. There's loads of different areas. You spoke about how you're using kind of AI in lending, risk management, for payments, underwriting. Uh, just personally, what you've seen from your experience, what area is exciting you most about the application of AI? You know, is it payments? Is it fraud detection? Is it lending? I 
I guess there is no right answer here. It's just a personal. Well, I think for me, um, the payment processing part is what I found the most interesting. Um, so right now we're actually doing one project at Finestra um, about the payment stuff. And, um, you know, we're using the, the most recent technology like neural network deep learning um, to um, see what, what's going on in the payment process. And if we can you know, automate the process and um, fix any errors on the flow. Um, so I think that's one very spe like special use case um, in the payment uh, processing part. And um, I think it's very new and um, hopefully we can get some good results there. Yeah, and for other like other traditional part, uh, we most like use the machine learning algorithm. Like in our uh, other like payment uh, and low like mortgage bot and our like retail banks, operate banks, like most of them like we use uh, like uh, the traditional machine learning models right now. Um, just another thing that comes to mind is if you think about lending and even payments for example it's something which uh, happens all around the world uh, but can vary depending on the country so i remember seeing a an article ages ago talking about alipay and the lending that they're doing in china and how the default rate is really low and it's amazing so using ai to essentially know which loans to to lend um, and someone brought up the, the concept that actually defaulting on a loan in China could have other impacts in terms of, you know, this whole idea of social scoring. So that AI model that works, say, in China really well may not work in uh, another market like the UK or the US. So just on that theme of taking an AI model and seeing how it works across different geographies, uh, I'm putting you really on the spot here. Have you seen any of that where you've actually used a model that's worked really well on something, you expected it to work elsewhere, but because it was in a different country or in a different con uh, different environment or concept, it's actually not worked? Yeah, this, this happens a lot. Like, uh, cause like we train the data and then we test the data in different like data sites. Even like for our like retail banks, the uh, like some projects we're having right now, uh, we have a pretty good performance on the data set. Like they provided us, but uh, but some like sometimes when we when we run this model in a different data set, it has like it, it doesn't have the uh, well performance the like uh, model as we used to have. So this where the like model tuning, like what Don has said, like the, the model tuning part comes from. So it's not like we have a universal like model for lending or we have a universal mo model for like customer churn, something like this. So we've had a question come in from Thomas. Um, so do you use in addition to neural networks, knowledge representational technology like web semantics um, or neural networks by themselves, are they able to perform the features that you have in the Genius platform? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a very important question, a very, very interesting one. Actually, um, we, we decided not to use these kind of technologies um, mainly because uh, it requires um, uh, it requires to be maintained by um, knowledge experts. And so when you start having large networks of knowledge, or what we used to call ontologies, then you have to maintain them. And so every time something changes, you have to update your stuff, and make sure that everyone agree with that. And actually, um, ontologies uh, have been the cornerstone of knowledge management. Uh, from let's say 1990s to 20 or, or until today, um, more or less. And the thing is that it's, it it doesn't scale really because every time you have to, to, to you know to discuss with knowledge expert whether you know you would put that new concept or that new data or that new information here or here and how do you relate that to all the existing knowledge you already have. Um, nonetheless, and as you just said, Nan. Um, we can't have a universal model that can do everything. 
So we store uh, specific knowledge in several ways. First, um, our genius reads all the customer's documents. So based on that, he builds its own internal knowledge base. Uh, and second, we uh, that's what I, that's what I, I I've shown. I don't yeah. That's what I, you know. You had the sum up or sum down button. So obviously, based on that, we enrich the knowledge of genius uh, based on the user's feedback. And then there is a third way we're using, which is uh, yeah. And okay, Thomas, I, I I insert that right after. And then there is a third way. Uh, to 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 get into account the, the user's knowledge is um, asking him to define question and tell genius this is the answer uh, I was looking for and then can we have neural network to transform text to ontologies um, yes we I think we can do that uh, you you can find research on that. Uh, but this is not something uh, we are uh, we are working on, because um, we think that ontologies, at least as they are uh, defined now, are, 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 are complex solution uh, for users, and we would like like the, the easiest possible uh, way of giving you the answer. Cool. Thank you very much for presenting, answering all the questions. I'm just going to wrap it up. Um, so a couple things. First of all, thanks for bearing with us on our first uh, live session. I know there was a bit of an echo on the video, video but we, we figured that out. Um, I'm just going to post in the comments a quick uh, link to a feedback form that we'd love for you to, to fill out. Um, it may have split over two comments because it's a long link. Um, I'll, I'll be following up with an email as well. Uh, and we've also got our next event happening uh, quite soon. So uh, we're going to be running a series of Behind the Hypes virtually uh, over the coming months. Um, and it's going to be quite often. So most weeks uh, we'll be having experts from Finastra, but we'll also be inviting more fintechs externally to come along to share their stories. Um, and if you're interested in hearing any more about what Finastra is doing in the innovation space, um, you can go on to fusionfabric.cloud. We've actually just done a, a blog recently about how we're uh, using NLP and a payments API to do a, a proof of concept. So there's tons of good stuff that we're putting out there um, just to um, just to engage you all on what's happening. So thank you everyone for joining, and we'll catch you at the next session. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.